So I'm Peter Ratcliffe from the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, and I want to welcome everyone. There, there are about 50 people here tonight, which is outstanding, and suggest that we're all finding ways to cope with this environment that we're struggling with. Um, and we can keep growing intellectually uh, at the very least. Um, many of you may know about the library. Some of you may not. I just want to explain that uh, we're located in the historic Carnegie Library on Greenbrier Street on the east side. Uh, Greg Gout, who will be speaking tonight, wrote a book about the history of our building uh, called Reinventing the People's Library. I encourage you uh, to take a look at that. Um, we are six and a half years old, and our focus is uh, on history, art, and culture as vehicles to provide context uh, for people from diverse communities to share their stories and experiences with each other in the hopes of inspiring solidarity, working towards justice and advocating for equity for all. Uh, for the last two years, we've had a great partnership with the Ramsey County Historical Society around this program called History Revealed. Um, I don't think we're ever gonna run out of subjects um, and it also seems like we're never going to run out of talented and interesting people uh, to present on those subjects. Um, so once a month, uh, we come together. We were doing it in person. Now um, we're doing it remotely um, to, to present uh, a presentation and to engage in some discussion uh, about the topic. This is a topic tonight that particularly interested us at the Eastside Freedom Library because issues of democracy in America are front and center today. And we think that studying history is anything but an escape uh, from the present, that studying history gives us insights and ideas to bring into a conversation with the present. So this seemed like a very appropriate topic and how wonderful that here we are on Veterans Day, formerly Armistice Day, um, a holiday that was created in the aftermath of World War I. So that's my intro and I'm gonna turn things back to Robin Priestley um, who is managing the tech and hosting the event. Thank you, Peter. Um, we appreciate the partnership with the Eastside Freedom Library. We love working with everybody there and coming up with these great programs to present, as Peter said, live for several years and now going online. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for participating tonight. As I mentioned previously, we'll keep your microphones and personal videos turned off for the time being. After Greg has finished his presentations, we'll turn you back on in case you want to share something um, after the recording is over. So I do wanna mention and ask everybody who may not be a member, first of all, to thank those of you who are members, but if you are not a member, please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to make these programs possible and to make possible all of our other efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining. So if you are interested, you can see our websites on the screen, www.rchs.com and www.eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Um, so we are working now on programs for 2021. And so we're coming up with some great ideas, including more programs on women's suffrage, voting and democracy to go along with our persistence, continuing the struggle for suffrage and equality, 1848 to 2020 exhibition that is available online until we can do it in person. Um, so watch for those programs on our website. Uh, we'll be working on those coming up starting right in January. But in December, we have a wonderful program on the book by Joan Grow and Lori Sturt event called Turnout. And that will be on December 3rd. So again, check our websites for where to sign up for that. And um, I'm really looking forward to that one. It's going to be fantastic. So 
both the RCHS and the Eastside and Freedom Library is committed to bringing the stories and histories of everyone in our community and making those available through publishing and through programs like this. So I'm really pleased about tonight's program on democracy and World War I. And I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Greg Gout. Greg is Emeritus Faculty at St. Mary's University in Winona, where he taught European and Russian history. Since 2012, he has worked as a historic preservation consultant, preparing National Register of Historic Places nominations for buildings across the state from Worthington to Ely. With Greg's wife, Marsha, they have contributed several articles to Minnesota History Magazine, two of which won the Minnesota Society of Architectural Historians Award for the best article on Minnesota's built environment. A lover of libraries, Greg has published Laird's Legacy, A History of the Winona Public Library, and Reinventing the People's Library, A History of the Arlington Hills Public Library, which, as Peter mentioned, is now the home of the Eastside Freedom Library. So welcome, Greg. Thank you for being here tonight. Okay, can everyone hear me? Is that, am I, is my sound okay? Okay, so um, today is uh, Veterans Day, uh, as uh, we've heard, but I'd like to invite you uh, to think of this day, as I put here on the slide, as, as Armistice Day. Armistice Day, of course, is the day in which World War I uh, ended. Two years later, uh, people started celebrating uh, Armistice Day uh, as uh, a way of remembering the terrible tragedy of the war and the coming of peace. And in 1926, it became a recognized holiday dedicated to world peace. In 1954, however, uh, uh, President Eisenhower changed Armistice Day to Veterans Day. And this ultimately changed the holiday from one dedicated to peace to one celebrating patriotism, uh, warriors, militarism, et cetera. So I would like this evening to join with uh, Veterans for Peace and other organizations who for several years have been working to reclaim Armistice Day. Uh, this in no way uh, means that we should forget the 118,000 Minnesotans who uh, were sent to France in 1918 or the 3,600 who did not return, but rather that we return to the original idea of using this day to advance the cause of peace, remembering that many Americans fought in World War I because they were told that this was the war to end all wars. Okay. In any case, what I want to talk about tonight is not the fighting over in France, but what happened here uh, on the home front. And I want to begin uh, by painting a scene. So imagine what it would be like to live in a society like this. Here's the scene I want to paint for you. In a well-planned military operation, two battalions of soldiers sealed the main street of the downtown district. Armed with wooden clubs they called persuaders, they confronted every young man and demanded identification papers. They swept through the bars, the pool halls, the dance halls, the movie theaters, and the train station. Those who could not produce papers were arrested. In the dragnet, over 1,200 were taken to detention centers. Where was this? W Warsaw in 1939, perhaps? Budapest in 1956? Maybe Johannesburg in 1960? No, actually, I made this scene up based on uh, reports of the Duluth Herald about an event that happened one night in Duluth in May of 1918. And similar scenes were played out shortly thereafter in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. This was the second year of the American involvement in World War I and normal democratic freedoms were curtailed. Okay, um, the Home Guard, a voice, a, voice, a voice of volunteer militia in the American Protective League a government sanctioned organization of amateur detectives were doing what they called a slacker raid, a search for young men who were avoiding the military draft. Minnesota was under something very much like martial law. Sweep arrests of the civilians by voluntary militias and self appointed vigilantes were symptomatic of what was happening on the Minnesota home front. The country, after all, was far from unified when President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany on April 2nd, 1917. Just five months earlier, he had won the re-election in part because he had steered the country clear of the European war, which had begun in 1914. Now that the United States was at war, 
he announced that he would seek passage of the Selective Service Act, setting up universal mail conscription. Knowing that millions of Americans, especially in the Midwest, were either hostile or indifferent to the war, Wilson told Congress that if there be disloyalty, it will be dealt with with a firm hand of repression. And he wasn't kidding. The country, however, wasn't just divided over the war. It was divided over a lot of things. Labor unions and the business leaders were fighting over pay, working conditions, and the very idea of collective bargaining. Farmers and big agricultural processes like the Minnesota grain millers were fighting over terms of trade. Women were fighting for the vote. African Americans were fighting against Jim Crow and lynching in both the North and the South. Millions of immigrants were trying to find a place in American society in the face of nativist hostility. All these tensions were heightened by the fact that income and wealth inequality had skyrocketed during the Gilded Age. Meanwhile, Many people fervently believe that banning alcohol would make everything better, an idea which others found preposterous. In a sense, America went to war not only against Germany, but against each other at home. But once the war was declared, most people accepted it. Some viewed it as an inevitability to be endured, but many greeted it with various levels of enthusiasm. Many progressives, the loose middle class movement for reform, supported the war in the hopes that it would foster democracy abroad and at home and end all wars, as President Wilson had promised. Conservatives supported the war because they hoped it would expand American power in the world and create an atmosphere where trade unions and leftist politics could be suppressed at home. Whatever the motivation, many men enlisted in a Russian incitement, conceiving of the war as a romantic adventure. About a month before the declaration of war, Leading business organizations in the Twin Cities wrote a bill to create the Minnesota Commission of Public Safety. Because the legislature was about to adjourn and would not reconvene until 1919, the business leaders asked the legislature to create a emergency body to govern the state during the course of the war. The Minnesota Commission of Public Safety was a local expression of the heavy-handed attempt of political elites nationwide to build patriotic unity during a controversial war. But in Minnesota, it was something more. The business class in Minneapolis and St. Paul was highly organized and committed to using political power to defend its interests. They created the commission as an institution to block the rising influences of farmers, trade unions, and left-leaning political organizations. Now, to understand this, we have to realize that there was three things that happened at the end of 1916 or the second half of 1916 that concerned the business community. The first was the militant, but ultimately unsuccessful strike up on the Iron Range that was led by the International Workers of the World, the IWW, the Wobblies. And when that strike petered out, the Wobblies moved on to the lumber industry and had a second strike in the early winter of 1916 uh, in the lumber mills in Virginia, in International Falls up north, and then also in the lumber camps. So the IWW had scared the business community with their ability to organize large numbers of immigrant workers up on the Iron Range and in the mines. Secondly, Tom Van Leer, Thomas Van Leer, a socialist, had finally won the election for Minneapolis mayor his fourth try, and he finally defeated the Republicans and the Democrats and became the mayor of Minneapolis. This wasn't so much a victory for the Socialist Party because uh, the party wasn't that strong, but Van Leer was a savvy politician and was very open about being a socialist and that socialism was his final goal, even though he was a very pragmatic politician in terms of city politics. This also upset uh, the business elites in Minneapolis because the Minneapolis mayor would then control the police, which made them very concerned in terms of labor strikes. And thirdly, the nonpartisan league had had amazing success next door in North Dakota. Here's Arthur Townley, the nonpartisan league leader who organized the nonpartisan league in 1915 was basically an organization of farmers, primarily wheat farmers, who felt they were getting a raw deal, especially from the grain millers in Minneapolis. 
and wanted to organize political power in order to kind of level the playing field economically. And they had spectacular success on the governorship, the House in North Dakota, and soon they won the Senate. And this was also very disturbing to the business elite in Minneapolis and St. Paul, especially because Townley made clear that the next uh, target of the nonpartisan league was Minnesota. In fact, they moved their national office uh, to St. Paul uh, in early 1917. So many in the business community saw the Minnesota Commission for Public Safety as a tool for maintaining the status quo and possibly even for crushing their enemies. The commission, here's another slide on the nonpartisan league, excuse me, it's a nice photo of um, organizing out on a North Dakota farm. And uh, nonpartisan league did a remarkable job organizing farmers in North Dakota. And now we're going to try to do the same thing in Minnesota. The commission was made of, of the governor, Joseph Bernquist, the attorney general, and five commissioners appointed by the governor. The legislature gave the commission the power to do all acts necessary and proper for the public safety and the protection of life and public property or private property, so long as these acts did not violate Minnesota law or its constitution. The commission had the power to seize and condemn property, to require people to appear before it and testify under oath, to investigate and remove public officials, to create its own military units, that would be the Home Guard, and to pass orders the violation of which was a criminal offense. The key appointments turned out to be John McGee, a very conservative lawyer and former judge who by virtue of his domineering personality became the de facto leader, even though Governor Bernquist was technically the chair of the committee. There were defense councils all in every state to coordinate the war effort, but the Minnesota Commission on Public Safety was very likely the most powerful of all of them. The powers of the commission were so extensive that several historians have used some form of the word dictatorship uh, to refer to the Minnesota Commission for Public Safety. Now, as the Catholic son of an Irish immigrant, John McGee was an unlikely candidate to lead the Minnesota Commission on Public Safety. Minneapolis business leaders were overwhelmingly old stock Americans who traced their ancestors back to the British Isles and attended Presbyterian, Episcopal, or Congregational churches. John, John McGee was, to be sure, an exceptional case. He was born in Northern Illinois, Northern Illinois, precocious young man, graduated from high school, then he read law, as they said in those days, with local lawyers, was admitted to the bar by age 21, eventually settled in Minneapolis, where he built a private practice specializing in complex commercial litigation. Within 10 years, he had been appointed a judge in the District Court of Minneapolis. He was reelected in 1898. He and his family bought a home on Pillsbury Avenue in the fashionable neighborhood west of Fair Oaks Park near, the, near where the wealthy business men were about to build the Minneapolis Institute of Arts in 1912. He left the bench in 1902 for financial reasons, which I mean to make more money, and returned to private practice specializing in litigation and involving banks and railroads. He was a member of the Minneapolis Club where businessmen staged, or the business has been lunched together in comfort and privacy and also strategized. Attorneys, however, whatever their ethnicity, were generally not part of the leadership circles of the business class. McGee's job was to represent and protect those interests of wealthy men like Pillsbury, Crosby, Washburn, Dunwoody, Lowry, the men who controlled the grain industry, the banks, the nukes, the streetcar monopolies. He developed a deep hostility for trade unions, the Socialist Party, IWW, and the Nonpartisan League. Although a former judge, he was impatient with the rule of law and prone to loose talk about using violence against his opponents. Now, McGee had a close relation with Senator Knut Nelson, who by that time was had become a very conservative Republican, in the far right of the Conservative Party. And he wrote a lot of letters to Nelson, which tell us a lot about what John McGee was thinking. His attitude toward labor issues comes across in a letter thanking Nelson for voting against the Adamson Act, which was the law that broke the, brought the eight hour day to the railroad industry and averted a nationwide strike. McGee wrote to Nelson, that was the most vicious act and cowardly that ever went through Congress. 
and I might add the most threatening to the future of this country and to the stability of Republican institutions. McGee's letters in 1916 argued furiously for American intervention in the European war on the side of the Allies, I mean, Britain and France. In this respect, he was also an exception because most Irish Americans had no interest in supporting Britain in the war so long as Ireland continued to be a British colony. McGee was irritated by politicians who tried to slow the movement towards war. Most of the 10 congressmen who represented Minnesota in the House in Washington were strong proponents of neutrality. He called them copperheads and hoped that they would be voted out of office in 1916, or as he put it, that axes that have already been bought and nearly every person with red American blood in his veins has purchased one can be used without hesitation next November. We like to talk about red American blood in his veins. In the same letter, he suggested a deportation fund for people of German extraction, expressed his uncompromising nationalism in blunt terms. Whether it be moral or immoral, he said, I believe in the maxim, my country, right or wrong. In the 1916 election, however, most of those congressmen were reelected. McGee, McGee told Nelson that the election results made him sick. And still worse was the election of Tom Van Leer, the socialist mayor of Minneapolis. That was the last straw, he told Nelson. When the crisis came, McGee was disgusted. And I say, when the war crisis came in April, when uh, Wilson asked for a declaration of the war, Wilson was disgusted that four Minnesota congressmen voted against the war resolution. He was happy, however, with the bill to establish the Minnesota Commission on Public Safety and played a role behind the scenes in creating it. He confided to Nelson that many people in banking, grain, and milling circles hoped that he would be appointed to the commission, and he made clear that he would serve if asked. He praised the bill, which he said had teeth in it 18 inches long. He worried that parts were unconstitutional and confided that he had a state senator inject an amendment into it, which provided that if one or more provisions were held unconstitutional, it would not invalidate the entire law. He concluded ominously that if the governor appoints men who have backbone, treason will not be talked down in the streets of the city and street corner, or, street corner orators who denounce the government, advocate revolution, denounce the army, and advise against enlistment will be looking through the barbed fences and internment camp out on the prairie somewhere. Now, uh, Governor Bernquist, of course, uh, did appoint him. Uh, and under his leadership, the Minnesota Commission for Public Safety demanded 100% loyalty and a moratorium on criticism of the government. The commission's program involved both persuasion and coercion. Its, its propaganda work was extensive, including a bi-weekly newsletter, an array of pamphlets, and, and an aggressive courting and monitoring of the press, all geared to persuading Minnesotans to give their unqualified support to the war effort. But John McGee was more interested in the, in the coercive side. He chaired the Military Affairs Committee, and under his leadership, the commission created a statewide network of forces prepared to coerce compliance. Now, I started researching on this, being primarily interested in the Home Guard, but it occurred to me eventually that this whole network of forces uh, that the commission assembled had to be understood piece by piece because they all worked together. So for example, number one, the commission appointed county directors in each county and set up local commissions of public safety. When these newly appointed county directors assembled in St. Paul for training in June of 1917, McGee told them that a citizen who is neutral towards the war, in effect, declares that he is a traitor. A man can be no more half loyal than he can be half honest, he told them. No more than a woman can be half chaste. He said, in effect, that a citizen who in no way opposed the war could still be guilty of being a traitor. He implied that citizens must not only serve the government, for example, in the military, but also conform their private thoughts and attitudes to the official views of the government, which in this case meant the seven men of the Minnesota Commission of Public Safety. This was his instruction to the county directors, and many of them took it to heart. So that's number one, this statewide network of local commissions and county directors. Secondly, was the Home Guard itself. So, 
When the war was declared, the federal government began absorbing the existing Minnesota National Guard units into the federal armed forces. Business leaders worried that the Guard's departure would leave the state exposed to sabotage. Actually, throughout the entire war period, there was no attempts at sabotage reported in Minnesota. Most likely, labor militancy was their basic concern. And in fact, curbing labor unrest was the most common use of the Guard during the years before the war. McGee responded by organizing the Home Guard, composed of units similar to the Minnesota National Guard, but made up of volunteers over the age of 30, that is not subject to the selective service system. They were mostly middle-class men from the business community. In fact, the civilian auxiliary, which was the Minneapolis business group's own anti-union paramilitary unit, became a Home Guard company for the city of Minneapolis. By the end of the war, the Home Guard had grown to 21 battalions statewide. Now, there was, ah, here's a Home Guard battalion. I should have put up. March in front of the St. Paul Federal Building. I wanted to say, though, that there was one Home Guard battalion that was not dedicated to preserving the status quo, which was basically the function of all the other ones. In St. Paul, the architect Clarence Wigington and other professionals in the African American community persuaded Governor Burnquist to sanction the creation of the 16th Battalion of the Home Guard, composed of African Americans, who at the time were excluded from the Minnesota National Guard and other Home Guard battalions. They were trying to crack open a little bit the segregated military, even if it meant segregated units. The difference here was, though, that the officers of the 16th Battalion were also African Americans. There were two St. Paul companies and two Minneapolis companies. And Wigington became the captain of one of the St. Paul companies. 16th Battalion did uh, what other Home Guard battalions did. They marched in parades, they had a band, they escorted draftees to the train station, but they were never called on to do any of the undemocratic acts, which I'll be describing in a little bit. Wigington, of course, uh, had a great impact on St. Paul's environment. He was about 36 or so, 37 uh, at this time, already a very established architect. Uh, and he went on uh, to a long career designing many important pieces of St. Paul's built environment, for example, the Harriet Island Pavilion and the Highland Park Water Tower. Okay, so that's the Home Guard number two. Now, number three, in addition to the Home Guard, which were essentially infantry units, the commission also authorized the Motor Corps, an innovation made possible by the fact that private automobile ownership had spread to the middle class. In May of 1918, Winfield Stevens, Wynn Stevens, a Pence automobile in Minneapolis, recruited volunteers who could supply at their own expense a five passenger motor car, which tended to limit membership in towns and cities to the business and professional class. Eventually, the Motor Corps grew to 10 battalions composed of about 2,400 men and their machines. So here we see them at a big encampment at, a, uh, at the National Guard camp at Lake City in September of 1918. Okay, so that's number three. Number four, the Home Guard and the Motor Car allowed, Motor Corps allowed the commission to project its power statewide, but they were poorly trained volunteers who, of course, had daytime jobs in banks and law offices and business offices. As a result, McKee also sought to replace the federalized Minnesota National Guard, which was being shipped off uh, for training and eventually supposedly to go to France, with new Minnesota National Guard regiments of similar training and equipment. Consequently, in addition to the Home Guard, Brinkfist authorized three new regiments of Minnesota National Guard during the course of the war. These new Minnesota National Guard units were sometimes deployed side by side with Home Guard units. That's number four. Number five, Minnesota Commission on Public Safety also had several surveillance services, which reported directly to McGee. The Pinkerton National Detective Agency was under contract for a while, and later the commission had its own in house secret service led by T.G. Winter, a grain dealer, a member of the Minneapolis business elite. Number six, in addition, McGee could rely on the American Protective League, an organization of amateur detectives which offered its services as a civilian auxiliary 
nationwide to the Bureau of Investigation, which was the precursor to the FBI. It had chapters around the country and claimed to have more than 250,000 amateur sleuths opening mail, spying on their neighbors, and generally monitoring the loyalty of citizens. The federal government sanctioned this operation and even gave the American Protective League agents badges, like the one you see, which said American Protective League Secret Service. Business leaders created a Minneapolis branch in November 1917 and gave, uh, and the office was given, and the federal government gave the American Protective League of Minneapolis an office in the federal building from which they managed nearly 500 agents in Hennepin County. Just as an aside, I, I think the American Protective League is, is one of the most amazing parts of this whole story because they were completely a volunteer amateur vigilante detective group which the federal government nevertheless sanctioned and even gave these silly badges to. Very much symptomatic of what was going on. That was number six. Number seven, many county sheriffs responded vigorously to the commission's agenda by creating their own groups of vigilantes, sometimes called rural guards, that could work with the home guards, et cetera, et cetera, essentially armed posses. And finally, number eight, the Commission for Public Safety also created its own or authorized its own peace officers, 600 of them, empowered to enforce the law. Now, this allowed the commission to convey police powers on county level directors of the commission, on home guard troops, and on APL members, on the American Protective League members. The head of the Minneapolis uh, Protective League routinely sent lists of names to McGee and asking them to send badges uh, to basically deputize these different members of the American Protective League without any vetting at all, other than the letter from the leader of the American Protective League saying that these men were loyal. And then McGee would send out these badges and, and deputize them. Now, the Commission for Public Safety, so this was the package of things. And I, I can say there's eight different pieces of this and all these forces could be coordinated and work together around the state. Now, the Commission for Public Safety did many things and, and some of them were um, commendable. It organized food distribution and food conservation efforts. It dealt with labor shortages on the farms. It provided disaster relief for victims of a tornado in the Northwest and for the famous Cloquet Moose Lake fires that happened during the war period. Uh, in a sense, it prepared Minnesota for prohibition because with its heavy handed regulation of the liquor industry during the war. It also contributed to the anti German hysteria by associating, by conducting an alien registration and banning the use of German in schools. What I want to focus on for the rest of this talk, though, is how the forces associated with the commission. Uh, use extrajudicial force to accomplish its political aims. Now, McGee himself didn't hide the fact that if he had his way, martial law would be declared, at least in Minnesota, in order to enforce 100% loyalty. In April of 1918, McGee appeared before a US Senate committee in Washington in favor of a bill which provided for trials before military tribunals of citizens accused of sedition. McGee came to testify in favor of these military courts, which he said would not be, as he put it, as chicken-hearted as regular judges or as undependable as juries. Where we made a mistake, he told the senators, was in not establishing a firing squad in the first days of the war. We should now get busy and have that firing squad working overtime. He made it clear that a nonpartisan league that the Nonpartisan League was inherently traitorous, no matter what its representative said or did. A Nonpartisan League lecturer is a traitor every time, he said. In other words, no matter what he says or does, a League worker is a traitor. As to the source of the problem in Minnesota, he was quoted as saying that it was primarily in Swedish and German areas. Now, I just want to stop and think about what he was saying. I, some of the things I had quoted earlier uh, from McGee were in private letters to Senator Nelson. But this was testimony in Congress, reported in all the newspapers. Quite amazing. Now, martial law 
which involves the temporary curtailment of civil rights up to and including arrest without cause and summary execution is obviously an extreme measure to be used only when the very survival of a government is in question. In fact, it's seldom been invoked in the United States. But it wasn't his call for this extreme measure that got him in trouble back in Minnesota. Rather, it was his questioning of Swedish loyalty. Several Swedish newspaper editors called for his removal from the Minnesota Commission of Public Safety and Bernquist received many angry letters. Upon his return to Minneapolis from Congress, McGee issued a statement denying any anti-Swedish bias and claiming that, quote, some of my warmest and most intimate friends are of Swedish birth and extraction. And this includes Governor Bernquist. He refused to back down from his support for military tribunals, however, reiterating that, quote, the certainty of conviction before such a court would prompt with a prompt appearance of the guilty before a firing squad would have had and would still have a most restraining influence on the disloyal, the seditious, and the traitors. Bernquist made no public comment on this incident and took no action against McGee. McGee never got the firing squads or the internment camps he desired, but under his leadership, the Minnesota Commission for Public Safety deployed a kind of de facto martial law, running roughshod over civil liberties, including the right to free speech, the right to free elections, and the right to walk the streets without fear of arrest without cause. I want to just describe briefly a few examples in which armed force, that is to say men with guns, trampled on civil liberties and the rule of law. Now, first one has to do with the IWW. And during World War I, this is mostly on a national level, federal government went after the IWW, had mass trials, convicted and deported most IWW leaders. And the Minnesota Commission on Public Safety was part of uh, encouraging this and trying to stop the IWW in the state. Uh, one incident involved the old uh, Minnesota National Guard Regiment from Duluth. This was in the late summer of 1917. The third Minnesota Infantry of the National Guard had been federalized, but it had not yet been shipped out to Camp Cody in Arizona where it was gonna go for training. And so they decided somehow to deal with the IWW themselves. So one day, a squad of these National Guard, probably without officers present, marched in good order down First Street in Duluth to the IWW headquarters, which you see here, drive there, beat up all the staff members they found there, and then completely destroyed the office and came back out on the street, lined up again in perfect order and, and marched back to their barracks. It was a dramatic and a remarkable event. This is no trial, no due process, no charges, just a kind of an organized vigilante action except by the actual Minnesota National Guard. Well, when the IWW and some other people complained, the officers said they knew nothing about it. They weren't involved and they didn't know what had happened. Uh, they said they would do an investigation, but a week or so later, the third uh, Minnesota Infantry was uh, shipped out uh, to Camp Cody uh, and there was never anybody held responsible for this. Similar thing happened in Bemidji uh, where there was a fire in a, a lumber yard. Uh, fires in lumber yards were pretty common and uh, there was never any evidence of anybody having set this fire. But nevertheless, uh, the Home Guard in Bemidji uh, and the local uh, Minnesota Commission of Public Safety County Director and the Sheriff got together and decided this would be a good excuse to round up all the IWW people. There was an office in Bemidji also and essentially deport them from the town and the county, run them out of town. And so, and so they did. So this was examples of uh, men with guns, uh, basically taking the law into their own hands, uh, dealing with a problem from their point of view and, and resolving it. One of the things that's scary about reading about this period is that um, the press basically uh, didn't get too upset about events like this. There might be a little bit of an editorial saying, well, it's too bad that uh, this happened. It really wasn't the kind of way we should do things. But after all, it was just the wobblies that were beaten up 
or destroyed or run out of town. And so therefore, uh, not such a bad thing. Well, that's number one. Uh, the second thing uh, I want to mention is uh, the slacker raids. Uh, the popular term for the mass arrests of young men suspected of draft violations. In the early summer of 1917, the Selective Service System prepared for the conscription of several million men who would make up the new army that would be sent overseas. The first step was to compile a roster of eligible men between 21 and 30. Uh, all young men between those ages were required to register on June 5th, 1917, and over 10 million young men did so. Then on July 20th, there was the first lottery, which held, was held to assign an order of call by birth dates, and two men were receiving induction orders. Now, the compliance with the registration was actually pretty good. The government didn't know how this was going to go, and they were actually pretty relieved at how peacefully and uh, with a large number of people who registered. But obviously, some people did not register. I think not very many in places like Minneapolis and St. Paul, but certainly more up north on the Iron Range. And nationwide, uh, apparently, there was a lot of people in the south, especially in rural areas, that didn't register, or in the west, there would be a similar case also. So the American, American Protective League made this a national project to try to find those people who hadn't registered, who were called slackers. Uh, and so uh, teaming up with the Minnesota Home Guard, they started doing these slacker raids in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, the first one was probably in March uh, of 1918 when um, Home Guard units in Minneapolis and about 130 American Protective League agents under the direction of the local Bureau of Investigation, remember that's the early FBI, raided the lodging houses of the Gateway District in Minneapolis, uh, where a lot of single men uh, uh, who were uh, working or unemployed, a lot of IWW people, et cetera, lived. And they took about 21 men into custody. That was kind of a, a warm up. Then they conducted a larger operation a few weeks later, in which about 250 agents joined by 12 companies of home guards raided, did raids throughout the city. This operation started at about 7.30 on a Saturday night and continued until 9 a.m. Sunday morning. Over a thousand men were arrested and held in a bullpen in the county courthouse. So what would happen is if you didn't have papers on you uh, proving your, uh, your draft status, uh, you would be arrested. Uh, but if someone from your home would bring the proper papers, then you would be released. The follow-up story in the paper the next day indicated that of these 1,000 men, only 24 of those arrested were still being held, and they were all waiting the delivery of their credentials from home. The, math of, the massive raid, the newspaper said, would likely not result in the capture of a single real slacker. But it did involve a thousand arrests. About a month later, the Duluth Home Guard and the recently formed uh, Fourth Infantry, one of the new units of the Minnesota National Guard, teamed up to take the slacker raid to a new level of efficiency. And this is the one I described at the beginning of the talk. They began the raid by blockading the main streets in downtown Duluth on a Saturday night, uh, and then rounded up everybody in that cordon, and then went on and arrested more people around other parts of the city. Eventually, 2,000 men were arrested in what the local newspaper called a citywide loyalty coup. Later that summer, Home Guard units conducted similar raids in St. Paul, netting between 400 and 500 men. News reports indicated that only six were still being held the next day, but all or most of them expected to provide proof of compliance. Two weeks later, a larger raid was carried out. Over 1,500 were arrested. For example, the Home Guard and the American Protective League agents met a river excursion boat docking at midnight at the foot of the Jackson Street Bridge and methodically searched all the men among the 600 passengers. About 50 men were arrested coming off the boat, leaving their wives and girlfriends to find their own way home. Well, meanwhile, the APL was doing these slacker raids all around the country, and it kind of climaxed in the spectacular slacker raid in New York City in September of 1918, which was a three-day affair involving thousands of American Protective League agents, soldiers, and policemen. In the end, there were 60,000 men arrested. And, uh, and uh, at that point, uh, there was 
rumblings in Congress. Even conservative senators demanded that the draft be enforced by sworn government agents rather than these overeager volunteers. Because the American Protective League had basically brought commerce in New York City to a halt for three whole days. And of course, they were finding very few uh, people who were out of compliance with the draft act. The New York raids spelled the beginning of the end uh, of the ATL. Well, that's number two. The third example has to do with uh, the Twin Cities rapid transit uh, strike, which is a very complicated story. I'll just mention very briefly. Um, Home Guard units from around the state were brought in to back up the Minnesota Commission for Public Safety, which very much took the side of the Twin Cities Rapid Transit Company in the strike that happened in 1917 and 1918. Uh, the transit workers very much wanted to get their union um, recognized. Uh, and the Minnesota Commissioner of Public Safety was hell bent on making sure no union was recognized uh, during the war. Uh, so they uh, refused to negotiate, they fired the union leaders, and then brought in the Home Guard uh, when the strikers tried to stop uh, the streetcars from rolling. The Minnesota Commissioner of Public Safety removed the Ramsey County Sheriff for not protecting the company's property and, and replaced the sheriff with uh, Home Guard units from around uh, the state. The strike uh, finally came to an end when the federal government sent a mediating team and they tried to mediate the strike, but uh, and the unions were happy with that. The state where the workers were happy with that, uh, but the transit company backed up by the Minnesota Commission for Public Safety uh, didn't comply with the mediated settlement. So eventually they won. The labor unions and the National Partisan League were really angry with how this was handled. They complained to Burnquist to remove McGee from the commission and appoint someone who would represent the interests of laborers and farmers. And I should have said earlier, uh, the Commission for Public Safety um, had no one from the labor movement or farmers uh, on it. It was a commission totally made up, at least uh, eventually, of conservative businessmen. The only person who was not a conservative businessman, conservative Republican businessman, was John Lind, uh, a former uh, governor and a Democrat, uh, but he quit the commission after about six months because he couldn't stand John McGee he was in constant conflict with him. So the labor movement and the farmers saw that the deck, the deck was stacked against them and they demanded that McGee be removed. Bernquist replied that he did not think of our state as being divided into classes. And so therefore he said, why, why would I have a, a labor or farmer representative on the commission? As to McGee, he told the nonpartisan league that there is no more patriotic citizen or anyone more anxious to see the United States win the war than he and that no, than, than McGee, and that no one will be more sincere in securing of justice for labor and farmers than McGee, which was not very convincing to the laborers and farmers. My fourth example uh, has to do with using armed force to win an election. And this is probably uh, the most troubling violation of civil liberties uh, that happened during the war period. And the target was the Nonpartisan League, um, that unusual organization that we mentioned at the beginning of farmers from North Dakota who are now organizing in Minnesota. They were called the Nonpartisan League because they uh, like to use the existing party structures, especially the Republican Party, and the open primary system to run their candidates within the Republican primary and sort of take over the party from within. And in 1917 uh, or 1918, that's what they intended to do in Minnesota. They nominated, uh oh, I'm sorry, this is a slide of some of those Home Guard members in during the St. Paul strike. This is the slide I was looking for. Uh, they nominated Charles A. Lindbergh Sr. Lindbergh was an attorney. Uh, to be their candidate in the governor's primary against Joseph Bernquist, the, the sitting governor. Lindbergh, an attorney from Little Falls, had served six terms in the House of Representatives. When in Congress, he had been the leading critic of Wall Street bankers, and he had opposed the drift towards war. After war was declared, he said that all Minnesotans must support the war effort, but like the Nonpartisan League, he criticized how the war was being funded. Since the big banks and the industrialists had so much wanted to go to war, he said, they should pay for it. 
If men could be conscripted to fight the war, he asked, why not wealth? Why not the armament industry? And so we have this kind of fine line of the nonpartisan league and Charles Lindbergh saying, no, we support the war. We're not opposed to the draft. If you're drafted, you have to go. But retaining the right to criticize uh, especially how the war was being funded. And this did not go over well with the Commission for Public Safety uh, and John McGee. Fernquist publicly branded the Nonpartisan League as disloyal. Here's his campaign poster. Fernquist, the governor, keep the party loyal. You see, that's the magic word. And implied that anyone who voted for Lindbergh was supporting treason. The Commission for Public Safety put its entire apparatus at the disposal, its entire publicity apparatus, at the disposal of the governor's campaign, branding Lindbergh as pro-German and disloyal while celebrating Bernquist. Now, Bernquist, of course, was the chair of the Commission for Public Safety, so. And its local committees hosted loyalty rallies around the state where Bernquist gave a campaign speech. It was interesting, Bernquist said because, said because of the war, he, he wasn't going to campaign for governor but he was gonna go around making patriotic speeches, which of course were campaign speeches hosted by the local commission for public safety. The commission for public safety heralded Bernquist as a great patriot who was saving Minnesota from traitors and leading the efforts to win the war. Don McGee for his part asked his friend, Senator Nelson to endorse Bernquist in order to keep, as he put it, an anarchist and a Bolsheviki like Lindbergh out of the governor's office. It's interesting, even in 1918, we had this early version of red baiting, calling people Bolsheviks or Bolsheviki, as, as McGee put it. The Nonpartisan League was confronted with statewide harassment as it tried to organize farmers during 1917 in the run up to the primary. Uh, and its leaders and local organizers were prosecuted under both state and federal sedition acts. There were total bans on nonpartisan league meetings in over 20 counties. There was mob violence, which local sheriffs sometimes passively observed, including beatings and the use of hot cars. Um, fortunately, this is only a hanging in effigy uh, of Lindbergh in a little town in, in Goodhue County. The county directors of the Minnesota Commission of Public Safety were often involved and apparently felt they were acting within their official duties. The Minnesota Attorney General sent county sheriffs a carefully worded opinion, remember now the attorney general is also a member of the commission, advising them to respect freedom of speech, but also telling them that any meeting, the tendency of which is to create or promote disloyalty to the United States in time of war should not be tolerated. Given that the sheriffs were at the same time being told that the nonpartisan league was by definition disloyal, the stage was set uh, for a breakdown of democracy. Home Guard units were sometimes involved in the efforts to suppress the nonpartisan league. In the Northwest County of Hubbard, the Home Guard arrested two nonpartisan league organizers in Akeley at the request of a local newspaper editor and put them on a train in 1918. One of the same organizers was arrested a second time by the Home Guard in March in Park Rapids, once again put on a train against his will, basically deported from the county. That same month, a Home Guard unit stopped a nonpartisan league meeting in rural Freeborn County. Sometimes the line between mob violence and official action was difficult to draw. In September of 1917, two nonpartisan league organizers came to Pine County to give a talk at Rock Creek. They were confronted by an unruly group of men led by the postmaster who had been drinking. The men said they had hot car prepared and also talked about lynching the two nonpartisan league men. At this point, the county director of the Minnesota Commission of Public Safety intervened, joined by the sheriff and a group of home guards. The sheriff decided to do nothing, but the home guards took custody of one of the men, one of the men while the other escaped in his car. The nonpartisan league organizer later recalled that the home guards appeared to be divided. Some of the home guards thought that maybe they should just let the crowd have its way with this guy. And the other half of the home guards thought that maybe their job was to keep the peace and avoid violence. Fortunately for this organizer, he had fallen into the latter group and they drove him out of town to a place where he could escape. Now, to facilitate um, campaigning, 
the nonpartisan league brought bought Model T Fords for its organizers. And by 1918, many successful farmers also owned automobiles. And so a common way that the nonpartisan league would campaign in rural Minnesota was to organize uh, car caravans and a motor parades involving dozens of cars, sometimes as many as 100 cars. There's a picture of one of those parades. And they would drive from small town to small town and have uh, mini rallies. It's kind of a show of strength as a way of campaigning uh, out in rural Minnesota. Um, the, in Goodhue County, the Nonpartisan League planned a motor parade around the county for June 11th, which was about one week before uh, the primary election date of June 18th. The county director uh, of Goodhue County Commission for Public Safety uh, went uh, farther or, and banned uh, any nonpartisan league parade into the city. He essentially declared martial law in Red Wing, uh, where the parade was supposed to end up, and ordered the national or the home guards of Goodhue County mobilized. The nonpartisan league leaders decided to keep driving towards Red Wing, even though they were told that they couldn't enter it. And when they got there, they found uh, that the home guard with bayonets and rifles was lining the streets and that they could not reach the park where they were scheduled to have a rally. And so although they reached Red, uh, Red Wing, they had to keep driving through. There was no other choice to do that. So a week before the primary, uh, Lindbergh himself was arrested for sedition while campaigning in Martin County in Southern Minnesota. The ultra patriotic county attorney sent the local sheriff to the farm where Lindbergh uh, was scheduled to have a campaign rally. It probably would have looked something like this in an outdoor rally somewhere else where Lindbergh was campaigning. Backed up by his own rural guards, the sheriff arrested Lindbergh for sedition just before he began to speak to a crowd of about a thousand. Local farmers quickly bailed Lindbergh out and the charge was eventually dropped, but he was forced to campaign in the final week under a cloud of a criminal charge. Although he had to campaign under conditions approaching martial law, and I talked about the sort of official banning of the nonpartisan league, but there was a lot of other kind of violence against the nonpartisan league. He was shot at, things were thrown at him, yellow paint thrown at the car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, Lindbergh carried 30 counties and got 43% of, of the vote in the battle against Bernquist. But Bernquist, when the primary went on to continue as governor, the outcome of a fair election uh, really can never be known. Well, the best thing about the Minnesota Commission of Public Safety was that its power ended with the coming of peace. But the commission had been quite successful. Uh, during its 19 months of rule. Business leaders had succeeded in essentially privatizing police power and using it to further their goals. Under McGee's leadership, the IWW had been driven from the state, the trade unions had made no gains, and the nonpartisan league electoral campaign had been defeated. However, the commission accomplished these things by putting democracy on hold. This suppression of civil rights, which some dubbed McGeeism, produced the political backlash. By targeting the labor movement and the farmers at the same time, the commission in a sense fostered the coalition which led to the Farmer Labor Party. And in the 20s, this new party would successfully challenge Republican uh, for power. Well, let me just leave, leave you with a few thoughts. Uh, I've been studying uh, the home front in World War I for several years. And uh, I've been thinking that given the violence, the polarization, the repression, uh, the nativist nationalism, the ethnic intolerance, the flaunting of the rule of law that went on during that period. It, it's pretty hard for me not to laugh these days when I hear the term Minnesota nice. Uh, Minnesota was not very nice uh, in 1917 and 1918. And I don't think it got any nicer uh, in the 20s or 30s. Maybe this sense of Minnesota exceptionalism has finally died, especially since Minneapolis made international news for terrible reasons this past summer. 
In any case, to the extent that Minnesota was exceptional during World War One, it was because it may have had the most repressive and non-democratic government, a non-elected commission of businessmen running the state in a manner approaching martial law. The home front experience World War One during World War One reminds us how easily patriotism can evolve into a dangerous, intolerant nationalism, how fragile civil liberties and the rule of law can be under stress, and how tempting it can be for leaders to stir up hostility for recent immigrants. The issues raised by Minnesota's experience in World War I have not been put safely in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg, for a great conversation. And he's sharing some important books here. So I'll let him- Yeah, while, while we're having questions, I thought I would just put up a few books uh, that people might be interested in if they wanna learn more about this period. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions right now. So um, thank you all for coming. Please check our websites for more information on upcoming programs.